words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. You know, there's a straightforward way to make sure that the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts are acceptable to God. Keep God's words in our mouths and keep meditation of God in our hearts. That's the key to success. Now, I mentioned in, in Bible study that since I was the student council president my senior year, I had the first parking spot in my high school parking lot. The only problem was I didn't have a car. Didn't have a car I could park in the parking lot. But after a lot of begging and pleading, my parents got me my first car. And at first, I was so excited. But then I found out it had one of those millennial anti-theft devices. You know, have you heard of the cars with the millennial anti-theft devices? The ones with the manual transmission? <laughs> Many millennials can't drive a stick. You can actually find some pretty funny videos on YouTube of would-be carjackers who run off because they can't even correctly handle what they're trying to take. They can't drive a stick. In any case, my car was equipped with a millennial anti-theft device. It also had some really remarkable rust spots, had some stupendous paint chips. It was, the car was the same age as me. You know, all the things that every 17-year-old dreams of for their first car. When my dad offered me the keys, I'm thinking, this car don't look cool. It's going to be hard to learn how to handle. Do I even want these keys? My brothers and sisters, do we even want these keys? According to God's word, today I offer the keys to success. But do you even want these keys? The keys to success are constantly reciting, meditating on, and obeying his word. But do we even want these keys? I'll tell you straight up, it's not going to look cool. What's cool changes with the shifting sands of society. And in our culture, every day, being a true Christian is becoming less and less cool. And I'll tell you straight up, sometimes it's going to be hard to learn how to handle it's often hard to understand and apply God's word. But as Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. We have to do our best even though the word is sometimes hard to handle. And it's often not going to look cool. But do we even want these keys? If we say yes, we have to mean it. We can't just give lip service. Lip service often refers to saying one thing with one's mouth, but not backing it up with one's actions. Talking the talk, but not walking the walk. But we must keep the Lord's instructions on our lips so we can better serve the Lord. This is what I like to call the Lord's lip service. The Lord's lip service. As we see in Joshua 1.8, the Lord tells Joshua, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. The Lord's lip service is the key to success. Now, many false prophets will try to twist this passage. It's not saying if you do this and that, that God will make you rich. A lot of carjackers can't even correctly handle what they try to take out of context. So let's examine the context. In this context, the Lord is about to give the promised land to the people of Israel. I think it's beneficial to review some of the history because there's no history more important than the history in God's word. 
And I don't want the holy history to be a holy mystery. Nowadays, we have Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime Video, and all these other streaming services. Now you can binge watch entire seasons of your favorite shows. Never in history have we had so much access to so much entertainment at our fingertips. And never in history have we had so much access to so much scripture at our fingertips. But do we binge on the Bible? In any case, if you start watching a show at the start of season six, and you don't know what happened in seasons one to five, you're not going to understand everything that's going on. Well, in scripture, Joshua is basically the start of season six. And if we don't know what happened in seasons one to five, the first five books of the Bible, we're not going to understand everything that's going on. So let's review some of the holy history so we can understand the significance of this historic moment in Joshua 1. And let's see if we can trace some very important themes. As you may recall, after the Exodus, the Israelites were supposed to inherit the promised land, as the Lord had promised Abraham. As we see in Genesis 13, 14 to 17, the Lord said to Abram, after Lot had parted from him, look around from where you are to the north and south, to the east and west. All the land that you see, I will give to you and your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. Notice how Abraham is not earning this land. He is not working for the land. The Lord is giving the land to Abraham and his offspring. After repeating this promise to Abraham in Genesis 22, it is also reaffirmed to Abraham's son Isaac in Genesis 26. As you read in Genesis 26, 2 to 5, the Lord appeared to Isaac and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land where I tell you to live. Stay in this land for a while, and I will be with you and will bless you. Will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands and will confirm the oath I swore to your father Abraham. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and did everything I required of him, keeping my commands, my decrees, and my instructions, my Torah. There are some important themes here. First, the Lord says, I will be with you and will bless you. As you may recall, our theme this year is God with us. Isn't it nice to know that God's presence is associated with blessing? My wife and I recently got a new kitten named Talia. Now, I may be a bit biased, but she is, in fact, the cutest cat in the world. Now, at first, Talia was very shy. She wouldn't even let us pet her. She was a scaredy cat. <laughs> she is. So for the first week, she actually lived in the bathroom behind the toilet. Until she warmed up to us, we had to let her have her space. Now, she runs the place. She chases her toys. She purrs like a car engine. And she runs up and down the stairs at 4 a.m. Love you, Talia. In addition, she's become more affectionate, especially when it's time to eat. Oh, yeah, when she hears me open up that can of Fancy Feast, she starts rubbing up all on me, making those cute cat noises, looking at me with those cute kitty eyes. Oh, yeah, we best friends when she's hungry. At other times, we just cool, you know. Cats can be kind of moody, you know. But one thing I notice is that when I reach out to pet her, she almost always does one thing. She sniffs my hand. She sniffs my hand. And if my hand is closed, she'll paw at me to open it up. She's not even focused on my face. She's focused on my hand. 
Because you know what she wants. She wants treats. Now, I know she's just a kitten and I'm just a man. But my brothers and sisters, do we seek God's hand more than we seek his face? That is, are we sometimes more focused with the treats God gives us than with God himself? Are we more concerned with his confections than with his countenance? Do we love his presence more than his presence? As you said around Christmas, the greatest of all presence is the presence of Christ. The presence of Emmanuel, who is God, with us. My cat adores me when she's hungry. Let's not only adore God when we want something from him. His presence is a present. It's a blessing that God is with us as he was with Abraham and he was with Isaac. And the Lord says to Abraham's son Isaac that he will fulfill his promise to Abraham because Abraham obeyed and did everything the Lord required in his instructions. And obeying and doing the Lord's instructions is a very important theme. In Hebrew, instructions is the familiar word Torah. And the Lord reaffirms the familiar promise. Isaac's family and offspring will be given the promised land. And the Lord again reaffirms his promise to Isaac's son, Jacob, in a dream. As you read in Genesis 28, 13 to 15. There above it stood the Lord, and he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you. I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. A lot of familiar language. Again, the Lord promises to be with Jacob and to give he and his descendants the promised land. Then, as you may recall, Jacob's son Joseph ends up in Egypt after being sold into slavery by his brothers. But the Lord was with him. Sometimes the people closest to us can throw us in a ditch. But as we see in Genesis 39, 2 to 4, the Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered. And he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. Then, as you may recall, Potiphar's wife lied on Joseph, and he ended up in prison. But the Lord was still with him. As we see in Genesis 39, 20 to 21, Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. Later, after Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dreams about the upcoming famine in Egypt, in Genesis 41, 38 to 40, it reads, So Pharaoh asked him, Can we find anyone like this man, one in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all my people are to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. You see, in Potiphar's house, the Lord was with him. In prison, the Lord was with him. And in Pharaoh's palace, the Lord was with him. Even Pharaoh recognized that the Lord was with him. So Joseph becomes second in command in all of Egypt. He's the head Hebrew in charge. <laughs> I can say that, right? He, I mean, he was. You know. And so he's able to help his family and his people when they come to Egypt because of the famine. Now, however, after the Pharaoh that put Joseph in charge died, 
the next Pharaoh started oppressing and enslaving the next generation of Israelites. Because he thought, the, he thought the Israelites were getting too numerous, he even ordered that all newborn Hebrew baby boys be killed. Similarly, in the first century, King Herod ordered the execution of all the Hebrew boys in Bethlehem under the age of two. You see, wicked rulers have no problems with innocent children being killed. But thanks be to God, the Lord was with Moses and the people of Israel. Through Moses, he sent ten plagues, walked them through the Red Sea on a red carpet, fed them man and quail from heaven, gave them water from a rock, and made a covenant with them at Mount Sinai, where he gave the Ten Commandments. Then sometime later, we see in Numbers 13, 1 to 2, the Lord said to Moses, send some man to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send out one of its leaders. So here they are at the cusp of the promised land. And Moses sends out a man from each of the 12 tribes as scouts. And one of the 12 who was chosen is none other than Joshua. So they explored the land for 40 days. And they found out that it's a good land. Looks good. Flowing with milk and honey. But 10 out of the 12 scouts said that the people who lived in the promised land were just too big to be defeated. Brothers and sisters, no matter what you are going through, no matter how hard your hardships are, no matter how problematic your predicament, there ain't no problem that is greater than our God. Maybe the Israelites forgot how big their God was. Did they forget who sent the ten plagues? Did they forget who parted the Red Sea? Did they forget that God was with them? They must have because everyone started grumbling against Moses and rebelling against God. Everyone except the other two spies, Caleb and Joshua. We read in Numbers 14, 6-9, Joshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had explored the land, tore their clothes and said to the entire Israelite assembly, the land we passed through is, and explored is exceedingly good. If the Lord is pleased with us, he will lead us into that land, a land flowing with milk and honey, and will give it to us. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not be afraid of the people of the land, because we will devour them. Their protection is gone, but the Lord is with us. Do not be afraid of them. Do we see the themes? The Lord is with his people. You see, Joshua understood that if the Lord was with them, they need not be afraid. He had faith that the Lord would be faithful to his word, that God would fulfill his promise by giving them the promised land. But the people were like, man, we should just go back to Egypt. At least there we have food. The Lord should have never brought us out. Could you imagine saying that? So because of their rebellion, the Lord makes another promise. In Numbers 14, 30, it says, okay, not one of you will enter the land I swore with uplifted hand to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. He continues in Numbers 14, 34 to 35, he says, for 40 years, one for each of the 40 days you explore the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it's like to have me against you. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will surely do these things to this whole wicked community, which has banded together against me. They will meet their end in this wilderness. Here, they will die. So God's like, did y'all forget what I did in Egypt? You've seen with your own eyes what I can do, and yet you doubt that I can bring you into this land? You want to go back? Fine. You won't go in. So the Israelites wander in the wilderness for 40 years until that entire generation dies. And at the end of Moses' life, he appoints Joshua as his successor. In Deuteronomy 31, Moses reaffirms the promise that God will give them the promised land and drive out the pagan nations who occupy it. In Deuteronomy 31, 5 to 8, he says, the Lord will deliver you 
the Lord will deliver them to you. And you must do to them all that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. One of our favorite phrases. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, in front of everybody, be strong and courageous. For you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid and do not be discouraged. Then in Deuteronomy 34, Moses climbs upon a mountain and looks at the promised land. In Deuteronomy 34, 4, it says, Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. So once again, Israel is on the cusp of the promised land. And now Joshua, Moses' successor, is about to take office. Now before I continue, this message is for everyone who has ears to hear. This is not a message particularly for the president. I'm not preaching to the president because I'm sure the president is not listening. And it's wise not to always interpret scripture through the lens of the current headlines. Scripture must be understood in its original context. Now, you ever see someone with road rage? Ever had road rage? Some people might honk. Some people might yell a few choice words. Some people might even flip you the bird. But notice that they do these things from the safety of their vehicle. They know they can just drive away and never see you again. And many times you can't even hear what they're saying to you. Some people might be cussing us out, we don't even know it. But we know it would be a different story if they were talking to us directly. You, as we say, say it to my face. It's a little different, right? I say all that to say it takes little courage to preach to someone who doesn't even know you're preaching to them. Now, preaching to y'all is a different story. Some of y'all know where I live. And some of y'all have known me since diapers. But I got to be strong and courageous. And so does Joshua. As you read right before today's text in Joshua 1, 1 to 6. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land I am about to give them to the Israelites. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river, the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, to the Mediterranean Sea in the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. I hope we really hammer these points home. The theme, God is with them. He's giving them the promised land. So through our recap of seasons 1 to 5, we can see that Joshua 1 contains a lot of familiar language and a lot of familiar themes from earlier in the show. Now our main theme in this season of Alpha Baptist Church is God with us. And the Lord promises to be with Joshua as he was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses. Joshua knew that they could take the promised land, which he had first promised in Genesis, if the Lord was with them. It's important to know holy history so scripture is not a holy mystery. So Joshua is to lead Israel into the promised land as Moses' successor. And the Lord is going to give him the keys to success. Continuing Joshua 1.7, the Lord says emphatically, 
Only be strong and very courageous, obeying and doing all the law that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn aside from it to the right or to the left, so that you will prosper wherever you go. As you can see, the Lord repeats many of the words already spoken in Deuteronomy 31. He commands him to be strong and very courageous. This is the language of the installation of a new leader. This is a commission. Earlier, Moses commissioned Joshua. Now the Lord again commissions Joshua. And the word translated be strong can also mean be bold. You know, it's easy to say things that everyone else is saying. It's easy to think things that everyone else is thinking. It's easy to join the chorus of the crowd. It's easy to go with the flow. But you have to be bold to go against the grain. It takes strength to swim against the stream. My brothers and sisters, we have to be strong and very courageous when speaking the word of God in an ungodly world. We have to be strong and very courageous when trying to live holy in the midst of those who are on a highway to hell. We have to be strong and courageous when spreading the gospel among the hostile. You know, young people are considered to be rebellious. And many people of all ages fancy themselves as rebelling against the system. But if you want to do something truly rebellious, read and apply God's word. Because most people ain't doing it. We are the true rebels who refuse to rebel against God. Now, biblical Hebrew is known for its parallelism. In today's text, there's a lot of pairs that go together. Be strong and courageous. Don't turn aside to the right or the left. Meditate day and night. Be prosperous and successful. Don't be terrified or discouraged. And many translations render this passage as be careful to obey all the law or be careful to do everything written in it. But I like to keep the parallelism going by translating this verse more literally as obeying and doing. Obeying and doing. You see, having two words with essentially the same meaning serves to give the command more emphasis. And speaking of words, as we said before, the Hebrew word for law, Torah, more generally means instruction or teaching or direction. And ironically, the word law doesn't do the word Torah justice. Torah includes not only commands, but also the accounts of God's salvation history in Scripture. These are more than just lists of rules to follow. These are divine directions concerning what it means to live for the Lord. Has anyone ever given you bad directions? Yeah, go through uh, three intersections, make a right, then a left, the pink house on the left. If you hit the train tracks, you went too far. Oh, those are train tracks. I guess I went too far. Back in the day, we, had, uh, we didn't have Google Maps. We had MapQuest. And, you know, MapQuest is really good at getting you, like, in the general vicinity. But, you know, <laughs> you had to ask someone for directions what you got real close. We hate when people give us bad directions. People have you driving all over town. But thank God we now have GPS. And thank God that in his word, the good Lord has given us good directions. The question is, will we follow them? As I said before, when you order something new, when you open the box, there's usually an instruction manual. If you're anything like me, you just toss that manual to the side and try to figure things out on your own. We have some, we've got two new mics today and having issues. I didn't read the instruction manual. <laughs> Before a service, we scrambled trying to put new, ma new batteries and everything. <laughs> That's why we got started at 11.07. <laughs> <laughs> but that's our problem in life we try to figure things out on our own instead of following God's instructions my brothers and sisters as we said if you want to get the most out of Windows doesn't it make sense to follow the instruction of Microsoft the creator of Windows if you want to get the most out of an iPhone doesn't it make sense to follow the instruction of Apple the creator of the iPhone if you want to get the most out of your Civic 
Doesn't it make sense to follow the instruction of Honda, the creator of the Civic? My brothers and sisters, if you want to get the most out of life, doesn't it make sense to follow the instructions of the Lord, the creator of life? That's why the key to success in life is keeping his law on our lips so we can better follow his instructions. And following the Lord means walking on the straight and narrow. Proverbs 3, 5 to 6 reminds us to trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. He will make your paths straight. Also, Psalm 23, one of our favorites, it says, he leads me in paths of righteousness. More literally, it says, he leads me in righteous tracks. Not turning to the left or to the right is an expression found throughout Deuteronomy and elsewhere that means not going off track. It means do not stray from the Lord's righteous way. Continuing Joshua 1, eight, it says, do not remove this book of the law from your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you will obey and do all that is written in it. Then you will make your path prosperous. And then you will have success. Do not remove this book of the law from your lips. We can put a lot of things on our lips that are not the Lord's word. We're talking about the Lord's lip service, but who do our lips serve? Some of us talk politics so much, you think we'd be working on a campaign. Some of us talk about our favorite team so much, you think we were on the payroll. And all parties and teams lose at some point. Why work for a loser? But as Deacon Johnson sang in prayer meeting on Thursday night, in the Lord's service, we can always sing, victory is mine. Work for a winner. Yet many people are bigger fans of characters than the creator. Many people are bigger fans of celebrities than our savior. But why talk so much about people who don't even know that you exist? Does your idol even know your name? Why spend so much time talking about people who ain't done nothing for us? When we can talk about God who did everything for us. And we can talk about the news every day. But with every passing day, a lot of what you see on the news becomes more and more irrelevant. In a few days, the news will be on to the next thing that's new. It's not called the olds. It's called the news. But the word of God will never get old, and it will never pass away. And it becomes more and more relevant each and every day. The news tells you what they think is newsworthy. But the most newsworthy headline is always the good news of Christ. Not to mention, just because you saw something on TV, it don't make it right. We've seen several bombshell reports that turned out to be nothing. And we might talk all about a story and tell everyone we know and find out later that it was just a hoax. Has anyone ever sent you a chain message? My goodness, I hate oh, group text. Whew. <laughs> get them group texts and you get like 30 replies. It's like, oh, man. Yes, yes, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you. My phone is ringing off the hook. <laughs> but you get them chain messages, right? One that says, pass this message on to everyone you know. Many times they're false. And we have to be careful because we don't want our lips to be in the service of falsehood. In Exodus 23, 1, the Lord says, do not spread false reports. Do not spread false reports. We may not even tend to, we may not mean to, but we could be spreading falsehood. So instead, let's pass on God's word of truth to everyone that we know. We can use our lips to talk, talk, talk about everything except the Lord. But there's no better topic than the Lord. So what do we be talking about? Here we say that metaphorically, Joshua is never to let the book of the law depart from his lips. The Lord's word is to continually be 
in his mouth. He should recite it continuously, and we should do the same. We praise the Lord with our lips. We pray to the Lord with our lips. But will we put the principles of the Lord on our lips? Will we put his Torah on our tongue? Will we communicate his commands? Will we speak his statutes? Will we recite his requirements? We sing about how much we love the Lord. Let's talk about the Lord that we love so much. You know, I really debated whether or not I should include so much scripture in this sermon. I know it was a lot. But this is exactly what the Lord tells Joshua to do. To keep the book of the law always on his lips. And this was likely not only to be a private reading. Joshua was to publicly read the words of the Lord to the people of the Lord. As we see in Deuteronomy 31, 11 to 13. When all Israel comes to appear before the Lord, your God, at the place he will choose, you shall read this law before them in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and children, and the foreigners residing in your towns, so they can listen and learn to fear the Lord your God, and follow carefully all the words of this law. Their children who do not know this law must hear it and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Brothers and sisters, whenever we assemble, whenever we get together, whether it's in the church or in our homes, whether we're on the pews or on the porch, we should read the law of the Lord so that we may listen and learn. Now, we have to understand that people in the ancient world, they did not have books with bindings and covers and pages like we do today. So a book could refer to any kind of document. Now, for Joshua, the book of the law likely refers to the law outlined in Deuteronomy. As we see, much of this passage alludes to words and themes found in Deuteronomy. And in Deuteronomy, Moses actually puts a copy of the Lord's instructions in front of the Ark of the Covenant Law. As you see in Deuteronomy 31, 24 to 27. After Moses finished writing in a book the words of this law from beginning to end. He gave this command to the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. Take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God. There it will remain as a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stiff-necked you are. If you have been rebellious against the Lord while I am still alive and with you, how much more will you rebel after I die? You see, when you tell somebody to do something, they can always say, oh, I didn't, you know, I forgot what you said. Oh, I didn't really hear you clearly, you know, it's my, my fault, I didn't really hear you. But when you put it in writing and give them a copy, they have no excuse. Moses makes sure he writes down God's command so that even after he's gone, they'll have no excuse. People are going to rebel against the Lord and encourage us to do the same. But we have to know what is written. We have to know what is written. When Jesus is tempted by Satan in the wilderness, he responds by quoting Deuteronomy. The devil comes at him sideways and even takes Psalm 91 out of context. The devil takes scripture out of context. The devil takes scripture out of context. But three times Jesus responds, it is written. It is written. It is written. We too should know what is written. So we too can avoid Satan's temptations. And this principle likely applies to all of God's Torah. Not just Deuteronomy, but all of God's instructions found in all of God's scriptures. My brothers and sisters, the Bible is the most popular and influential book in all of history. What better book could we possibly read? If we've been Christians for years or even decades, we should know this book like the back of our hand. The key to victory is to read your history. That is his story. 
and we have to meditate on his word. Now, when you think of meditation, what comes to mind? What comes to mind when you think about meditation? We think of someone sitting quietly and privately while emptying one's mind, chanting, and or focusing on one's inner thoughts. According to Webster's Dictionary, to meditate often entails engaging in mental exercise as concentration on one's breathing or repetition of a mantra for the purpose of reaching a heightened level of spiritual awareness. You'll find this practice in a lot of Eastern religions. However, this is different from the meditation we find in Scripture. In Scripture, this word refers to planning or repetitive and reflective thought. When someone meditates on God's word, it involves repeatedly reflecting on the word of the Lord in order to conform his one life to the word of the Lord. So biblical meditation is not about emptying your mind, but filling it with the directions of the divine. We're just saying, fill me up. Fill my cup. Let's fill our cup with the Torah of the Lord, with the instructions of the Lord. And the topic of this reflection is not on oneself or what one has to do, but on the Lord and what the Lord has done. For example, in Psalm 63, 6, the psalmist says to the Lord, On my bed I remember you. I think, meditate of you through the watches of the night. Psalm 77, 12 says, I will consider all your works. I will meditate on all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Have you ever lied awake at night thinking about all he's done? Have you ever had daydreams about his divine directions? How much do we think about Jesus? And this word translated meditate is often translated as mutter or utter. So this meditation is likely not something that is completely silent. It likely included reading and reciting the Lord's instructions out loud. Actually, in the ancient world, silent reading was very rare. No wonder Joshua was commanded not merely to keep God's directions in his heart, but to keep his law on his lips. And just as we see in Psalm 1, Joshua is to meditate on the Torah of the Lord day and night. In other words, we should be be reciting and reflecting upon God's word all the time. Lord knows there's a lot of TVs that are on day and night. I have some TVs on right now. But we don't need our eyes on the screens day and night. We need his law on our lips day and night. You ever see a car so dirty that someone can write with their finger, wash me? You ever see a Bible so dusty that someone can write with their finger, read me? In our study, we disciples need to be disciplined. In our lives, we have to make the reading and applying of God's word a priority. There's only 24 hours in a day, and they say time is money. So say we have $24 in a day. How much attention do we pay to God? Reading the Holy Word of God should not be a chore. It should be a delight. If reading more than a couple verses feels like too much, we have to pray for a desire for his word. As Psalm 119, 36 and 37 says, Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. As Reverend Land said in a recent morning prayer, let's not major in the minor things. There's a lot of minor things in life, but let's not major in the minor things. And now we're talking about the Lord's lip service. That is, we must keep the Lord's instructions on our lips so we can better serve the Lord. But we can't just give God lip service. We must talk the talk and walk the walk. In fact, the word says that talking the talk should lead to walking the walk. That is, we should keep the Lord's instruction on our lips so that we will obey and do all that is written in it. 
We know that some people can say one thing with their lips, but their lives tell a different story. And the Lord knows when we're just giving lip service. In the first part of Isaiah 29, 13, it says, These people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And after mentioning two people who had left the Christian faith, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, sealed with this inscription. The Lord knows those who are his, and everyone who confesses the name of the Lord must turn away from wickedness. You see, you can fool a lot of people with religious talk, but you can't fool God. And everyone who professes to be godly must turn away from ungodliness. This is the key to success. Now, many will take texts like Joshua 1, 8 and others as guarantees for success in all one's endeavors and financial prosperity if one is truly righteous. And the converse is also thought to be true. That is, if one is not succeeding or if one is not prospering, well, then you must not be righteous. However, this is not what the scripture is saying. And moreover, Psalm 73 and the book of Job make it abundantly clear that this is not always automatically the case. And under the new covenant, in the New Testament, godly living is often rewarded with worldly persecution. In any case, this word prosperous or be prosperous refers to godly prosperity. It refers to accomplishing God's purpose. And in the 59 times in scripture that this word is used to describe prospering, only once is any kind of financial prosperity in view. This is not a prosperity gospel. Furthermore, this word translated have success more frequently means to act wisely. In the relatively few cases where it does refer to success, it's related to following the Lord's commands because that's true godly success. A lot of people read about prosperity and success and automatically think about money. But there's a difference between godly success and worldly success. Worldly success means a big bank account. Godly success means knowing you're accountable to God. Worldly success is about getting the highest salary, the highest grades, the fastest times, the highest scores, the most money, the most wins. Worldly success is about being at the top. Godly success is about keeping God at the top. Worldly success is about how many people are below you. Godly success is about how well you serve the God above you. Godly prosperity is about accomplishing God's purpose. Not about worldly promotions, but about godly devotion. Not about earthly awards, but about serving the Lord. Godly prosperity is not primarily about finances, but about faithfulness. Now, if you ask people, what's the key to success in life? What's, what's the key to success in life? Many people will say, a lot of people will say, well, education. Education, knowledge is power, and education is key. Was it Schoolhouse Rock? What's somebody say? Somebody said that. <laughs> but being educated in ungodly things likely won't lead to godly success. As we said, it's not just about education, it's about dedication. And if we're not dedicated to the creator of the world, we haven't learned the most important principle of this world that he created. Not to mention that Princeton University, which boasts a Bible on its crest, my wife and I saw a lot of our educated classmates do a lot of foolish things. Truth be told, I did some foolish things too. My point is you can succeed in school, yet fail to be wise. It doesn't matter if you're on the honor roll, if you don't know your role of bringing God honor. Joshua 1, verse 9, continuing in Joshua 1, 9. It says, haven't I commanded you? Be strong and courageous. 
do not be terrified and do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. As the Lord has commanded before, he says, don't be terrified. Don't tremble. And don't be discouraged. Don't be dismayed. And why shouldn't he be afraid? Because the Lord is with him. As the Lord was with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and Moses, the Lord is with Joshua. It may be hard to keep the law on our lips, but God is with us. It may be hard to meditate on it day and night, but God is with us. His presence will enable Joshua to follow his instructions. And through the Holy Spirit, his presence can enable us to follow his instructions. My sisters and brothers, we can't pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Joshua won't have success without the Lord's presence. And we can't have spiritual success either without help from God's spirit. No matter what we go through, we can have the blessed assurance that God is with us. You know, a few Sundays ago, I totaled my car on the way to service. My car spun out of control. I hit the median on the left, then I hit the guardrail on the right. And after the dust settled, I yelled a few choice words. I was like, man, I'm going to be late for service. I'm going to be late for service. But thanks be to God, I got here in time to get everything set up. And I walked away with just a scratch. I could be going right now. But the Lord was with me. I believe the Lord was with me. That was actually my first car that wasn't a teenager. And that was my first major accident. But all my previous cars ended up broken down on the side of the road. So I've had a lot of different car keys in life. Today I got my wife's car keys. So I got to get home real quick after service. I'm sorry. Can't talk. She's on call. <laughs> we can talk later. <laughs> But even when your life spins out of control, remember the most important key in life, the Lord's lip service. We must keep the Lord's instructions on our lips so we can better serve the Lord. In this world, our lips can be in the service of a lot of things, but our lips should be in the service of the Lord. Don't delay, because one day it will be too late for service. We sing that song to the Lord, your words, my mouth, your thoughts, my mind, I'm yours. That's the key to success. On the cusp of the promised land, we're not told that God gave Joshua military strategy. We're not told that he gave him economic advice. Rather, he's told to follow God's spiritual instructions. If he didn't keep God's righteous requirements, his leadership would fail. This was to be his first and foremost priority. And this should be our first and foremost priority. We must first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all the other things will be added unto us. The key to success is not a great army, but to put on the great armor of God. So don't be afraid of this wicked world. Don't be discouraged by this sinful society. Be strong. Be courageous. Because it's not going to look cool. And it's often going to be hard to handle. But reciting, meditating on, and obeying God's word are the keys to godly success. The question is, do we even want these keys? May the words of our mouths and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen.